Welcome everyone. Bring it started here. Welcome to Jesus and the Pagan Deities. First question, name the Pagan Deities. Okay, so we got Horus. We got Jesus. That one's a freebie. You're not getting that one. You know who they, these two guys are? Anyone know who these two guys are? Not Isis, no. Not Ra. Ishtar. Ishtar, heard Ishtar. Do you know who this one is? No. Is that Mithras? Mithras, yep. Yeah. Anyone know who those three up there in the top corner are? Cool. That one's easy. This one's easy. Yeah, okay. Do you know who those two are? No. Dionysius? No. This is Osiris and Zalmoxis. You'll never get Zalmoxis. Zalmoxis was a Thracian deity. So. so, have any of you ever heard that Jesus is not special? He's just like these other guys. He's just another pagan deity. They all rose from the dead. They all died. They were born of a virgin, that kind of stuff. How many of you have heard that before? Yeah. Well, it's all nonsense. <laughs> and I'm going to show you why it is today. So let's get started here. Okay, so there are two types of mythicists. Okay, these are people who think Jesus didn't exist. He was just a copy of pagan deities. You can have the extreme mythicists. Jesus didn't exist. He was just a copy of pagan deities. You need a moderate mythicist. They'll say Jesus was just like other pagan deities, not a direct copy. They'll say, in the ancient world, every culture wanted a dying and rising God. This was just one for the Jews. You know, you could say it's like a theme in a movie. How many of you have seen that one movie where there's a rogue cop who doesn't always follow the rules, but he gets the job done, even if he bends a few of them? Yeah, everyone's seen that movie a hundred times. They'll say Jesus was kind of like that. So not a direct copy, just following the same theme. We're going to debunk both of those today because this is just nonsense. So what do mythicists need to do to make, to show their argument that Jesus didn't exist and he was just a copy of pagan deities? First, they need to show correlations between Jesus and pagan gods. They need to show they are not just hasty generalizations. You just can't be like, Horus did miracles and Jesus did miracles. Therefore, they're the same. That's not how it works. They need to show that correlations predate Christianity. So sometimes they'll bring up Dionysus and they'll say, Dionysus turned water into wine. Yeah, that comes from a third century text. post dates the New Testament. Shut up. <laughs> then they need to show a causal link between the New Testament and pagan literature. Okay, because correlation is not causation. You actually have to show that the things are not just similar, there's a causal link. So does the New Testament quote a pagan text to make a connection? And then they need to show that Jesus didn't, act, didn't exist. Because even if they were successful in one through four, it still would not get to five. And I'll prove that to you at the end of this. So even if one and four are successful, it doesn't even get to their conclusion. The first thing mysticists do is they have to make a correlation causation fallacy. Causal relationship is assumed simply because some elements line up. So Socrates and Confucius were both philosophers. They had disciples. They were hated by the ruling class and persecuted. Anyone think that one is a copy of the other? That would be silly. Both Ramesses II and Tutmosis III were wealthy pharaohs. They had conquests, they fought rival empires, they had massive building projects, and they reigned for long periods of time. Anyone think Ramesses II didn't exist because he's got correlations with Tutmosis III? That would be silly. Correlation is not causation. You can't assume one is a myth just because it sounds like the others. I love this image. You see that we've got pyramids in Mexico, in Egypt, in Indonesia. Someone goes, what does it mean? And someone says, that, my friend, is exactly the question you have to ask. And then the bottom one, it means this is the best way to pile up rocks and not have them fall down for a long time. Because <laughs> that's the truth. Correlation is not causation. The Mexicans were not copying the Egyptians. They just, this is just a similar way to build. Everyone calm down. So let's talk about some of these pagan deities. Here's what they'll say about Horus. Horus was born of a virgin Isis on December 25th in a cave. No. Star in the East announced his birth. He was visited by three wise men. He had an earthly father named Seth, which translates to Joseph. He was baptized by Anup the baptizer. He had 12 disciples. He performed miracles like walking on water. He raised El Osiris from the dead. He gave a sermon on the mount. He was crucified between two thieves. Buried for three days and was resurrected. 
He's called Christ, anointed one, the way, the truth, the light, Messiah, son of man. Pretty convincing. That sounds a lot like Jesus, right? What do you say when someone says this to you? Source. Okay, you just can't make that claim. All of this is practically wrong. None of this is in any ancient Egyptian sources. Someone says, Horus was born on December 25th. I go, what's your source? Where does it say that? Sometimes they'll be like, well, it's in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Really? You know, we got phones now. I can pull that up right now. I can pull up Egyptian Book of the Dead translation. Tell me where it is. They won't do it because it doesn't exist. If you go through all of these, all of these are wrong. The only thing that is right here is that he performed miracles. That's it. Because he's a god. Gods do miracles. So, can they show there are correlations between Jesus and pagan gods? No. The only one is performing miracles, which we would call a hasty generalization. So, this whole process fails. Let's look at Mithra. Mithra was a Persian deity. They'll say he was born of a virgin on December 25th and visited by shepherds. They love December 25th. He was a traveling teacher, had 12 disciples, sacrificed himself for world peace, was buried in the tomb and resurrected for three days later on Easter morning, followed his promised immortality, called Good Shepherd, Savior, Redeemer. His holy day was Sunday, and his followers partook in the Lord's Supper every week. Well, let's look at some of these. Was he born on December 25th? Oh my goodness, Encyclopedia Britannica says he was. It was the birthday of the Indo-European deity Mithra. Checkmate, Christians. Gotcha there. Okay, not everything in Encyclopedia Britannica is right. Here's an actual Mithraic scholar, Roger, Roger Beck. He says, in truth, the only evidence for the celebration of the birthday of Invictus on that date is calendar of Philocalus. Invictus is, of course, Sol Invictus, Aurelian sun god. It does not follow that a different, earlier, and unofficial sun god, Sol Invictus, Mithras, was necessarily or even probably born on that day, too. So, there is no evidence Mithra was born on December 25th. Encyclopedia Britannica is wrong. So sometimes you may even get a source and the source is just wrong. Ask them for primary sources from the ancient world. Did Mithra have 12 disciples? This is the image they'll use. This is a depiction of Mithra surrounded by the 12 zodiac, not a picture of his disciples. Besides, Gemini should be two disciples, so she should have 13. This is an image of zodiac. In the Persian Iranian version, he's got one companion. And in the Roman version of Mithra, he's got two. There's no evidence he had 12 disciples. You go through all this, can't find anything. Was he born of a virgin? No, it says he was born out of a rock. How many of you think you were a rock before you... No, you weren't. Quiet. We call that a category error. Uh, all this is false. Now, his holy day was Sunday, but Michelle Salzman says, notice that the Mithraic use of Sunday postdates the New Testament. So the Christians could not have stole that from the Mithraic cult. So you can show there are correlations, show Sunday worship, perform miracles, but our hasty generalizations and the correlations don't predate Christianity, so it doesn't work here either. What about Buddha? They'll say Buddha was born on December 25th of the Virgin Maya. His birth was attended by wise men. The angels were singing. He was pronounced ruler of the world. His life was threatened by yada, 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 the same nonsense. Most of our information on Buddha comes from a second century text. Now, if you do your math, this postdates the New Testament. So Christians cannot be stealing their stuff on Buddha if the biography of Buddha wasn't written. When we go through the biography, none of this is there. It's like, yes, he, his birth was attended by wise men because he was the son of a king. Oh, kings had wise men. Okay? So he was of divine lineage. That's true, too. There's a story of him being tempted by an evil demon, Mara, but that's nothing like the temptation of Christ. Uh, they, they tempt him with, like, you know, like sex and wealth and these kinds of things. And so, you know, he did miracles, sure, but I mean, like, so what? That's just hasty generalizations. So, here are the only ones you can see that line up. So, birth attended by wise men, royal lineage, was tempted by a demon, a miracle worker. Now, St. Jerome says Buddha was born of a virgin. Now we got an early source. 
So maybe he was. What Edward Thomas says, the oldest accounts of Buddha's ancestry appear to presuppose nothing abnormal about his birth. Merely speaks of him being well born on his mother's and father's side of seven generations. So, just because an early author may say something, it also doesn't mean they're necessarily right. The primary, St. Jerome is not a primary source on Buddha, surprisingly. So you just can't be like, well, I found an ancient author. Okay. Is he, a, is he an actual reliable source this time? Uh, no. He's a Christian author, not a Buddhist. So we can show there are correlations, sure. But they're hasty generalizations and they post-date Christianity. It doesn't work. So these are more of the extreme mythicists that I mentioned earlier. Moderate mythicists like Richard Carrier that I would classify as are a little bit more cautious in the way they do this. They'll bring up Osiris and he'll say, not only does Plutarch say Osiris returned to life and was recreated, exact terms for resurrection, and also described as physically returning to Earth after his death, but the physical resurrection of Osiris' corpse is explicitly described in pre-Christian pyramid inscriptions. So he's not saying Jesus is a direct copy of Osiris. It's just part of the theme of the ancient world, guys. This is just, you know, what Christians were doing. Carrier also says, when he's talking about pagan deities and Jesus, he says the differences are what established them as different gods and not just revamped versions of the same god. So it's not a direct copy, is what he says. The differences are irrelevant, apparently. Cultural diffusion and syncretism, by definition, always produce differences between the originating existing belief and the resulting new beliefs. So it's illogical to argue that because God A is different from God B, that therefore God B mythology was not adopted from God's A. To the contrary, ideas are witnessed as pervasive. Many different kinds of virgin births, many different kinds of resurrections are seen as bearing a cultural commonality. And that commonality is then adapted to a specific belief system creating a new religion. The process always involves transformation. Those differences are what is brought, brought, brought by the native adopting culture and then added to transform the adopting culture. Now, my first problem with this is like, he says the commonality is adapted by a specific belief system creating a new religion. What is your evidence that's what they were doing? You just can't assert this is what they were doing. You need to show this is what they were doing. Correlation is not causation. You can find similarities, but that doesn't show there was a common borrowing process. He goes on and says every dying and rising God is different. Every death is different. Every resurrection is different. All irrelevant, he says. The commonality is that there is a death and a resurrection. Everything else is a mixture of syncretized ideas from, a, from the borrowing and the borrowed culture to produce a new and unique God. So you get a get general idea of his ideas here. He's not saying Jesus is a copy of Osiris. He's saying like they had a resurrected deity of Osiris. The Jews really liked that. And they were like, well, let's just come up with our own kind of dying and rising deity. We'll just make it more Jewish. First thing we note is what we're basically seeing in this aspect is boils down to what we call an equivocation fallacy. This is where when a particular word is defined in multiple sentences throughout an argument leading to a false conclusion. Here's an example. The sign said fine for parking, so I parked there because it said it was fine. <laughs> you see, officer, you can't give me a ticket. Or, I don't see you can say you're an ethical person. It's so hard to get you to do anything. Your work ethic is bad. Okay, well, ethical and work ethic are being defined different ways. It's an equivocation fallacy. You're defining the word with different meanings and therefore trying to draw a connection. So when it comes to Osiris, Egyptian resurrection doesn't mean Jewish resurrection. Equivocating on the term resurrection, it means something different in different cultures. Henry Frankfurt said a while back, Osiris, in fact, was not a dying god at all, but a dead god. He never returned among the living. He was not liberated from the world of the dead. On the contrary, Osiris altogether belonged to the world of the dead. It was from there that he bestowed his blessings upon Egypt. He was always depicted as a mummy, a dead king. In Egyptian mythology, resurrection does not mean you return to life on this plane of existence. It means you die, your body stays here, your soul goes to the Amduat, the underworld, and you're given a new body there. Therefore, you're resurrected. And you stay there. You can't return here. So you're gone forever. That's not what Jews and Christians mean by resurrection. Other scholars like Jay-Z Smith said, in no sense can Osiris be said to have risen in the sense required by the dying and rising pattern. In no sense can the dramatic myth of his death and reanimation be harmonized 
to the pattern of dying and rising gods. The repeated formula, rise up, you have not died, whether applied to Osiris or a citizen of Egypt, signaled a new permanent life in the realm of the dead. Shirkman Manager says Osiris rose to continued life in the netherworld. The general connotations are that he was a god of the dead. So, just because the texts say resurrection, this is not a similarity with Jesus. Because he just goes to the underworld forever. That's not at all what the Jews meant. There's not even a similarity here, other than just the title, Resurrection. Now, one of the books I cited was The Riddle of Resurrection by Trigvay Manager, which Carrier, Richard Carrier, uses as a source. Not in the Osiris section, though, surprisingly. So he's aware of this book, but didn't, but ignore the fact that Manager basically debunked this. He doesn't engage with it. Manager also says in his book, there is, as far as I'm aware, no prima facie evidence that the death and resurrection of Jesus is a mythological construct, drawing on the myths and the rites of the dying and rising gods of the surrounding world. <laughs> While studied with profit against the background of Jewish resurrection belief, the faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus retains its unique character in the history of religions. The riddle remains. So, Jesus' resurrection is not even similar to what dying and rising gods would have done doesn't even compare according to Medinger. They're completely, it's completely unique. It could not just be another dying and rising theme that we see along other dying and rising gods from the ancient world. So when it comes to Osiris, sure, you can show there are correlations. Those correlations predate Christianity, but they're just hasty generalizations. When you get into the specifics, Egyptian sense of resurrection is nothing like the Jewish sense to the point where it's just obviously not a comparison. And of course, there's no causal link. No one's citing Osiris texts. Correlation is not causation. Let's talk about this deity. This is a goddess called Inanna. There's a text about her called The Descent of Inanna. In the text, she descends to the underworld. So she's stripped, she's crucified. They say she was dead for three days and three nights, and then she resurrected. Sounds like Jesus. The text is available online. Anyone can go and read it. Very easy to find. Not as descent. Translation. In the text, here's what we see. She descends to the underworld. Okay? When she gets there, she's stripped of one piece of clothing at seven different gates. Okay? So she eventually is naked. Tries to seize the throne of the underworld. She tries to take the throne for herself. But the gods of the underworld are so powerful, they just pronounce her dead and she's dead. Then after she's dead, her dead body is hung on a hook. That's not crucifixion. <laughs> then, after a little while, she's brought back to life. Now, anyone notice I'm missing the concept of three days and three nights? Not in there. It's in the text. But where is it? So, she says, this is Anana speaking to her servant. Early in the text, she says, On this day I will descend to the underworld. When I've arrived, Ninkaburu, arrived in the underworld, that is, make a lament for me. Okay? Beat the drum for me in the sanctuary. Make the rounds of the houses of the gods. So when Inanna gets to the underworld, Ninkaburu is supposed to start lamenting for her. Then we read, in between these two texts, we read that Inanna descends and dies. So Then we read, after three days and three nights had passed, her minister, Ninkaburu. She made a lament for her in the ruined house. She beat the drum. She made the rounds of the houses of the gods for her. What mythicists have done is they've misunderstood the text. It doesn't say she was dead for three days and three nights. It says that her descent to the underworld took three days and three nights. They've assumed the three days and three nights corresponded to her death, not her descent. So Inanna is not dead for three days and three nights. They misread the text. It corresponds to her descending because it's an instruction for her servant. So in the text, yeah, she descends to the underworld. She is stripped. She's not crucified. She's not dead for three days and three nights. And she doesn't resurrect. Why? It's Jewish resurrection is a concept where you're a human, and then you die, and then you come back to life in that body in a glorified state. And Nana is not human, so she doesn't have a human body, and she doesn't come back to life in a glorified state from a mortal body. Therefore, it's not the Jewish concept of resurrection. She's just resuscitated. So I got Baal. Have you any of you ever heard of Baal? Really? I can't. I don't believe you. 
He's in the Bible, but there's also a tale about him called the Baal Cycle. It's in an ancient city called Ugarit, and it's a story about Baal defeating the, the sea god and then the god of death. Richard Carrier says in the myth, the god is definitely dead. One text even right where it says, and the gods will know that you are dead, and multiple gods actually declare him dead. And then he is buried in funeral rites of reform. In fact, his returning to life and then living forever are used as analogies in pre-Christian immortality spells. And notice who he cites there, Medinger, Riddle of the Resurrection, pages 69 and 71. I have that book. Let's go see what it says. It should be remembered that the basis for the hypothesis that there was some ritual procedure connected with Baal's death and return is very tenuous. So Carrier is wrong about what his own source says. It doesn't say there are pre-Christian analogies. It says the opposite. It says there's a connection that's tenuous. So did Baal die and rise? So scholars like Trigvay Manager, Dag, Enzo will say yes, he was. Scholars like Mark Smith, J.D. Smith, Johan C. C. Moore, Hans Barstead, John Gibson say no, he did not die. Why is that? Why are they just, can't they just read the text? They can't because it's fragmented. A lot of it is missing. In the tale, the, the god of death, Mott, challenges Baal to a fight. And then Baal descends to fight him. And then the text is missing. So we don't know what happens. It's unfortunate. Uh, but then when we come back in the story, the gods are lamenting because they think Baal is dead. They think he is dead. And then all of a sudden, Baal shows up. And they're like, oh, you're alive. The end. Doesn't say he resurrected, though. Mark Smith is clear. He does not say he resurrected. So it's a fragmented text, as I said, it's missing parts. Never says Baal resurrected. It just refers to the other guys realizing Baal is alive. In the Ugaritic text, the gods are not omniscient. They could just have been mistaken. Baal could just have been missing for a while. In fact, Baal's a storm deity in the ancient world. And oftentimes, storm gods go missing. No, they don't die, they go missing. Because, you know, you have the rainy season and the dry season, and where does the god go? Well, he went away on something, you know. Also, a much later text, this is an Arabic text, but it says, it seems to be citing the Baal cycle. It says, Mott has celebrated a feast. The scorner eats, established in the, in the succession of the nights and days. And behold, Baal is cut off, cut off indeed, but not dead. Now, it's not the Baal cycle, but it seems to be commentary on it, and it's suggesting that maybe it was understood in the cycle that he didn't die, he just went missing. And Mark Smith compares Baal to um, other storm gods, like the Hittite storm god, Telepinu. Both storm gods responsible for nature, disappearance, disappearance issue and it issues a divine search. The sun god helps in the search in both tales. The look in the mountains, it's a concern for royalty. There's another storm deity, Narek. Both of them hide in the underworld, kind of thing. So Mark Smith is saying, well, maybe the Baal cycle is just a Ugaritic version of a missing storm deity. The god doesn't die, he just went missing. So at the end of the day, you know, it's, we don't know. Now, Trigmay Manager says, yeah, he thinks Baal likely dies in, in the story. But he says also the pagan gods he covers are nothing like what Christians espoused about Jesus. There's, there's no similarity. The storm deity, Baal, if he dies in the myth, it's a cycle thing. It happens every year. Dying and rising gods in the ancient world were connected with, like, the vegetation cycles or the storm cycles. They die every year and they come back to life. Does Jesus die every year and come back to life? No, that's silly. We don't think that. They were related to cycles and seasons. Jesus is a unique character. If you were going to make a myth like these dying and rising gods, you wouldn't make Jesus, who's a unique character, you'd make another like cycle god, a vegetation type god, who comes back to life every year, connected with that aspect. They didn't do that, though, if they were copying pagan myths. So it's unique, as Trigmay Manager says in his book. So, I want to return to this point. Let's say they find a pagan deity. They show those correlations. They're not hasty generalizations, and they predate Christianity, and they actually find a causal link. That still would not show Jesus did not exist. It would not. You may be asking yourself why. I'll give you a really good example here as to why. You ever heard of him? Wasn't he constantly compared to King Arthur and Camelot? Does that mean he's a myth? Because he's compared to mythology. No. 
That is nonsense. People often take current events of their day and they compare them to stories they like. How many sermons have you been in and someone has made a comparison to some movie character like Frodo in the Ring or Superman? We do that. We make comparison to stories we enjoy and like. Just because if the New Testament writers were doing that with Jesus, that would not mean Jesus was not a miracle worker, didn't exist. They could just be like, wow, it's just like those other gods we heard of. We use these type of things. We'll say someone has a Midas touch, modern day Robin Hood, modern day Sherlock Holmes. Oh, that detective man, just like Sherlock Holmes. Doesn't mean the detective we're talking about didn't exist. Now, Robert Christ is a mythicist. He says, but wait, when we read about Jesus, it keeps connecting to the Old Testament. Mark 1 draws from Psalm 2 and Isaiah 41. Then it draws from Exodus 2, 15 and 1 Kings. Then Mark 3 draws from Exodus 18. Then Mark 4 draws from Jonah, Psalm. Mark 5 draws from Psalm and apparently the Odyssey. Uh, Mark 5 has a complex reworking of 2 Kings 4. Mark 6 draws from 1 Samuel. So his argument is that the New Testament is just reworking stories in the Old Testament. It's all mythology to him. So, problem with that though. That's often how ancient writers worked. Tacitus embedded such points in the very language which he used, and he used linguistic echoes and structural similarities. Jan Bremer, Nicholas Horse, fall note Virgil, Virgil borrowed from Roman legends to paint the current events of his day. So Virgil would write about Augustus Caesar, and he'd compare him to Romulus. He'd compare him to Zeus or Jupiter. He'd compare him to Hercules. That does not mean Caesar or Augustus didn't do that things. They were using the texts of the day to compare it to current events they were experiencing. Bruce Molina and Richard Rohrber say to be able to quote the tradition from memory, to apply it in a creative or appropriate way, not only brings honor to the speaker, but lends authority to his words as well. Luke 1, 68 to 79 is an example. It is stitched together from phrases of Psalm 41, 111, 132, 105, 106, and Micah 7. The ability to create out a mosaic implies extensive detailed knowledge of the tradition and brought great honor to the speaker able to pull it off. So just because we see numerous new Old Testament passages in the New Testament, that doesn't mean they're creating mythology. They did this kind of stuff on purpose. Oh, Jesus fed the 5,000? Elijah fed people. Oh, Jesus raised a little girl from the dead? Elijah raised someone from the dead. Moses delivered his people? Well, Jesus is delivering his people. They do these kinds of connections on purpose. The same thing we do. So even if... We can grant him all of these. I won't grant him the Odyssey one. That's ridiculous. But even if we grant him all these things, that does not mean that New Testament is mythology crafted from passages of the Old Testament. Very much people will see current things happening around them and they'll go, it's just like the thing we read about in the Bible. So, at the end of the day, even if you can show similarities with Jesus and these alleged pagan deities, it doesn't prove anything. We have no evidence that Jesus was being compared to them in the New Testament, but even if they were, it could just be, hey, reminds me of that one God I heard about kind of thing. But at the end of the day, they're quoting the Old Testament. They're not quoting pagan literature. And there's no evidence they actually were focusing on that. So, at the end of the day, there's no evidence Jesus is a copy of pagan deities. And with that, I can take questions. So we say that, you know, that Jesus was born in the spring, which is a more believable time period, as opposed to December 25th. Could we say Jesus was born in the spring? Yeah, uh, like, yeah we don't believe that December 25th was really Christ's birthday. Oh, we don't know. I'd say it's a 1 in 365 chance it is. <laughs> uh, here's the thing. No one in the ancient world knew their birthday unless you were a king or a ruler. I mean, can someone tell me the date? Why? why you don't know the date off the top of your heads right now? What? It took you a little while. But you've got calendars and phones and stuff. Now take all that away. And then in a month, tell me the date. Yeah. You won't. Most people in the ancient world did not know their birthday. They know, like, you were born sometime a month or so after Passover. Or around Yom Kippur. People just didn't, they didn't know the exact day for everything. So you probably didn't know Jesus' birthday. were probably Mary and Joseph. That's why it wasn't preserved. Because they didn't know, they didn't have complicated calendrical systems in the day. So we don't know. 
Was Jesus likely born in the spring? I don't know. The date of December 25th was not picked because of paganism. The early church believed that Jesus actually was born on that day. They had a belief that prophets would die on the same day they were born, but they thought with Jesus it would be the same day of his conception. They believed Jesus died on March 25th. Therefore, that's the day he was conceived. You count forward nine months, you get December 25th. So that's why they picked the date. Is it accurate? I don't know. I don't care. Yeah. Don't you think that the story between Jesus and Barabbas sounds coincidentally similar? Did I say anything? Or, or is it Jesus and Barabbas? Yeah, it sounds coincidentally similar to the scapegoat and sacrificial lamb in the debate when we made the 16. Yeah, you could make a comparison there. I think they may be making an allusion to that. But I mean, Barabbas is not sent out with sins on him. He doesn't actually atone for sins in any way, like the scapegoat but was. He's spared. He's spared, yeah, sent out into the wilderness. But he, this goat was sent out into the wilderness to die. Barabbas comes into the among the people. He's brought into the people. So he's free to live among the people, not sent out into the wilderness. If they were going to do that for a comparison, you'd have to send him out into the wilderness. They don't do that. And so, you know, it's probably more likely it was just a custom that they had. I did a video on Jesus and Barabbas on my channel a while back and showed there were similar customs about people being given to the crowds when they asked outside of Judea. Uh, it's probably more likely that, that, that it's not seen as a scapegoat because he comes into the people. He's not atoning for sins. Sins aren't placed on him. Uh, it's, I think it's more of an analogy between the idea that they're, re they're taking the wrong guy. You know, they're, they're, bring, they're rejecting the king and bringing the sinner into the people. That kind of thing. Uh, forgive me, I came in a little late. So if you said this at the beginning, so sorry if I'm causing you to repeat yourself. Um, I remember that Lewis and Tolkien had a conversation about myths, and I think Lewis said something similar to, well, Christ is kind of similar to the mythology that I study. And then Tolkien responded with, well, Jesus is true myth. Like, all these other myths are not real, but Jesus is sort of the true myth that all myths are based on. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, is Jesus the true myth that C.S. Lewis argued for? Um, it, 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 so that was C.S. Lewis's idea that Jesus yeah. is similar and quite frankly he was just wrong uh, Jesus has a unique character in the history of religions he's not similar to these pagan deities and in his time there were some of those ideas being put out so he you know it's not like he was just ignorant it's just that was a common theme you know you had uh, James Fraser putting some of that stuff out so yeah you had that basic idea but I don't think that uh C.S. Lewis was right about that. No. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've seen some uh, strange posts on Facebook where uh, people that are Christians are talking about, uh, in a conspiratorial way, that the Old Testament Yahweh was really Baal. Oh. Can you speak to that? And it, and it comes to, like, this so, was Yahweh, the question is, was Yahweh really Baal in the Old Testament? Yeah. Yeah, like, yeah. It's I a don't know how to respond to that. They come back with all of this I mean, the, the, that, like, I'm like, I the way to respond to that is go. Well, that's not what the text says. Right. Like, like you can have a theory yeah. based on these weird correlations you can find. That's not actually evidence. Really, what a lot of scholars say is that they'll make the argument that Yahweh used to be a storm deity in the south, and Baal was a storm deity in the north, and then when the Israelites brought worship of Yahweh and they were competing. And so that's why Baal's his major rival. And I'd say that's nonsense. We don't have any texts that ever say he was a storm god. Our earliest texts, like Numbers 23, 24, Exodus 15, describe him as god, creator type, head deity type thing. Like they don't, they equate him with El. They say his name is El. They don't say his name is Baal. So they're basically making a conjecture on very, very limited data. <coughs> And that's not fair. You need an actual evidence for that. You just can't be like, well, there's similarities. Like he competes with Baal, therefore he must also be a storm god. That's a conjecture from very, very limited data that they just can't do. Some scholars speculate that's the origin. I don't see enough evidence to support that. Why are all of our texts, which are in the Hebrew Bible, speak of him as a head creator deity, never as like a lesser god that was like a storm god? So. I think that's just making a conjecture on too much limited data because they want the biblical religion to be 
paganism that evolved so they can dismiss it. And I think that's just not fair with the data that we have. Oh, well, they're going to try to argue that it's the Roman Catholic Church suppressing the truth and they're just entered fantasy land. I mean, that's just conspiratorial nonsense. There's no evidence of that. Oh. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Um, what do you make of the, the theory that Yahweh had a wife and that wife was Asher? So what is the theory about Yahweh having a wife that was Asherah? So, uh, yes, at one point the Israelites decided God needed a wife. And the prophet said, you were wrong, that is stupid. Uh, so yeah, this definitely happens in ancient Judea. This is, it's in the biblical text where we have direct evidence for them doing that and being condemned. So, just like you have with Christians preaching Jesus as God, you had other groups come out later called the Gnostics that preached a weird combination of Greek mythology, some of their own ideas, blending with Christianity. And they were condemned as heretics. Likewise, in ancient, according to the biblical narrative, the ancient narrative is that God reveals himself, the Israelites rebel and syncretize him with other gods, reduce his glory, thinking he needs a wife, and the prophets are sent to condemn that. So, yes, we can acknowledge the ancient Israelites thought God needed a wife and say, Duh, that's what the Bible says they were doing, and it was wrong. It was condemned by the prophets. So you could argue there was a, there was a, a group in Israel that retained the faith that was handed down from Moses that preserved the actual truth and fought against the heresy. Hmm. I've heard academics say that, um, that the Israelites are actually Canaanites. So they'll say the Israelites are actually Canaanites. Uh, yeah, they'll make this argument. Uh, we'll say there's definitely similarities between the Israelites and the Canaanites. They share a common culture. You know, the Israelites live in Canaan. They have similar culture with the Canaanites. Uh, but so we, should, and ex we would expect that some of the Israelites were descended from Canaanites because, you know, Judah took a Canaanite woman. Uh, sometimes the Israelites did breed with the Canaanites, so we should expect that the descendants of Israel should have Canaanite DNA in there, so that shouldn't be an issue. But they, according to their own uh, texts, say that they retained a unique identity that came from an, uh, an Amorite called Abraham. So I don't see that as much as an issue. It depends on how we define Canaanite to include people of the whole Levant. We could say, yeah, in that broad sense they are, but they didn't create their own distinct culture, distinct from the pagan Canaanites in Israel. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the, uh, the Atwell nonsense? Joseph Atwell nonsense? Yeah, so there was this idea uh, by Joseph Atwell that Josephus and the Roman government created Christianity and made up Jesus to sort of control the population. Like the Jews rebelled in 70 AD. So after that, they made up this religion called Christianity to try to pacify the Jews and keep them calm. And then it got out of hand. Joseph Atwell is not a scholar, he was a lawyer, and he was laughed at by just about every single scholar out there for being a nut and pushing out this crazy nonsense that made no, absolute no sense whatsoever. Uh, no one took him seriously, and his work is just rejected by every single scholar I can find out there, yeah. In light of that, why don't you uh, talk to us about Acharya S? Yeah, another crazy mythicist. Acharya S is the question. Shari S. is a, another crazy mythicist who put out some of the ideas I've said here before about these pagan deities being mentioned, uh, having birthdays on December 25th and that kind of stuff, utter nonsense. You'll see a lot of these types of people online. A lot of them just make up claims like Joseph Atwell or Acharya S. Because for whatever reasons, attention or whatever, and they're just lying to the population. So just because someone will say a name like that, don't believe them, you know. Well, I've not read Jonathan Kahn's book. Like, so the question was, is 
pagan worship returning like that. Uh, I, I mean, we are seeing a rise of neo-paganism in interesting ways. I know there's more pagans that are active online. Uh, I don't know what could happen. I don't think paganism is a, is a religion that really can beat Christianity. I mean, just look at history. Christianity spread around the world and just beat paganism wherever it went. I think there's this, just a minor like hiccup along the way here where people are going to try something new and they're going to realize that it just doesn't have the same foundational support what Christianity has. I think what we're seeing with like returning like this rise of paganism and new age ideas is a consequence of secularism. As people leave Christianity, we don't become these enlightened atheists that just worship reason. People still seek the divine and the sacred and so they've been told Christianity is evil and wrong, so they start looking for it in other ways and that's one of the ways they tend to do it. But I don't think it's gonna I don't think it has long lasting ability, honestly. Having this theory that Yahweh was a storm god, and then yeah. somehow they didn't jump to him being the head god. How do you feel with that argument that says, hey, at one point most of the ancient world was polytheistic, and then they minus a few gods or a lot of gods, and eventually they had like maybe a few gods, and eventually they got down to one god who was god of everything? So the question is, is the question is, did, did it evolve? Did polytheism evolve slowly into mon monotheism by reducing gods? That's just not how religions work. I mean, you look, look at like the uh, Arabia. It didn't go from polytheism to a few gods and then eventually Islam. It was polytheism and then Islam, revolutionary like movement that took over. Uh, same with a lot of you know like Hinduism. It's been polytheistic for generations. No evidence of evolving slowly into monotheism. That's just not how religions work. They, they, there's revolutionary changes that happen overnight, not slow progression evolution type thing. So. When some biblical scholars say, well, yeah, the, the biblical religion slowly evolved out of polytheism. It doesn't fit any model I can really think of. Uh, there might be something that could explain, but it seems more likely that it would fit with like this revolutionary idea with like an early figure like Moses who comes on with these polytheistic Israelites because Joshua says they were worshiping other gods in Egypt and across the river. Uh, and then Moses says, no, you're doing this wrong. This is our religion. This is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to worship God. And then there's a struggle between the people who want to hold to the old ways and the revolutionary idea. And then that just continues up until the exile. So I don't think that's, there's no, a, good, a lot of good evidence that's how religions work. That's been asserted without a lot of evidence to support it. All right. Thank you all for coming.